Welcome back to the None of Our Businesses podcast, the uh, nonprofit uh, accounting podcast from an accountant's perspective. I'm one of your hosts, AJ Wheeler, and uh, not just one accountant, but three other very talented accountants with us this week is Tammy Hess. Hi. And Mark Pallardy. Hey there. And Tony's back. We didn't scare him off last week, but he's here. Tony, welcome. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Got a, got a great show for you. Uh, got three articles for you as usual. The first one is uh, Major Gifts, How Two Fundraising Pros Landed Major Donations. Uh, we'll learn about what that takes and some maybe some uh, advice from the panel here on, on what to do with major donations or donors in general. Then uh, nonprofits who get uh, go to scale, how you can use uh, information technology and current social media to boost and amplify your message through nonprofits and Tony has some great examples of that in the article. And then uh, finish the summer strong uh, with your nonprofit. So what to do in those lean, slow times of the end of summer and how and how your nonprofit can benefit from those slow times and what to do during your slow time after the end of summer. Anyway, we'll talk about it. And then last for this week, our do's and don'ts series is continuing. Do's and don'ts of recruiting team uh, team members. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about good things, bad things, do's and don'ts, advice from the panel, but we'll, we'll go over it. So uh, let's see. Who's got our first article this week? Mark, I think it's you. Go ahead, jump in. Yeah, thanks, AJ. Um, so my first article is Major Gifts, uh, Two Fundraising Professionals Successfully Made the Ask um, by Tony Beal at a Nonprofit Hub. Um, this article is interesting because it talks about major gifts and major donors. Um, and basically the, the premise of the article is that using the Pareto principle, 90% of your revenue is going to come from the top 10% of your donors. So as, so as such, you should be cultivating those donors and, you know, learning how to work with them, how to, you know, make the ask in a style that they're interested in. And oftentimes at a nonprofit, you'll have a department or a person assigned to major donors that they can start to really cultivate that connection with. Um, The article goes into depth as to how you kind of determine what your major gift range is. And it's interesting because, right, if you're United Way, your major gifts is going to look a lot different than if you're, you know, a mom and pop nonprofit who are raising funds, you know, in your two or three man organization. So, in order to determine who your major donors are, they basically say, look at your top five to 10 individual donors, not not your foundations, look at the range of what they're giving, um, and then take that lower end range, the minimum, and then kind of make that your threshold for major gifts. And then you can start to try to cultivate more people to come into that major gift category. You can reassess, test, right? If you're not if you don't have very many people meeting that threshold, maybe you need to lower it a little bit. And, and basically the idea here is once you kind of identify this, you're going to want to cultivate the relationships, figure out how you want to solicit or ask for that money, and then move forward in stewardship. A lot of the same things that we've talked about regularly, you know, building authentic relationships, figuring out what is your ask, what, you know, are you asking for a specific program? Are you asking for general funds? You know, figure out before you approach what your ask is about, uh, explaining how that gift will make a difference, how you're going to measure the success. Uh, and, and then also very important is what objections you might encounter in this process. So um, I thought this was an interesting way of looking at it, you know, and, and we've been focusing a lot on foundations and grants, but with our article last week where we talked about how 70% of donations seem to come from individuals. I think it's really important to, to kind of really focus on some of those major donors, especially knowing that they might be 90% of your donation pool. Um, so I'm curious what, what you all thought of this article. Yeah, I thought it was eye-opening. Um, so I thought there were some really good points in there about, you know, um, first coming prepared, right? You want to have something prepared for these major donors that shows, you know, how how their how their funds will impact what it's going to impact and then ha- and how the success would be measured not unlike you reporting back to a grant uh grantor on the results of a, you know their their gift or their their grant or contract um i think it's totally feasible and really prudent to do the same with large donors i mean you're asking 
proportionately a large amount of money for your organization from these individuals, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, really, really setting them up so that they understand how, what, when, where how their money's being used and how it's going to support the organization is vital. And a lot of these people are very savvy donors. So it's good to kind of earmark how it's going to be spent, when it's going to be spent, who it's going to be spent on, I thought was really vital in this. And, you know, again, we're talking about relationships here. So I don't know. We had an article a couple of weeks ago, I think, or maybe do's and don'ts. I'm, they're all running together at this point, but uh, where there was an opportunity for these donors to mingle with each other, you know, and kind of get to know each other. You're, what you're, you're really trying to foster a community here. And I think, you know, not only, you know, the ask and the major donor portion of it, but how are you going to, you know, a real part of this is how are you going to, you know, thank these donors for what they're doing, how you're going to recognize them so that they feel a part of the organization and not just a paycheck that's coming in. So a really good article though. I'll add to that as well. I think the thing that kind of, I always kind of think about is that to think about all donors, you know, like even like the, what you make me, I do appreciate the fact of like really defining the major gifts and major donors, but to me, all donors are equally important. And, and what may be what someone may say, oh, this is a little donation from, you know, somebody else. It could actually be a big donation from their personal pool of, of money that they're choosing to allocate. So building those relationships and thanking people and doing all those things, you kind of have to do that no matter what donation, you know, if they're a major donor or a minor donor. And, you know, I would probably try not to classify them that way because I do think that, you know, you should really seek and value all donation levels because a, a, a smaller donor could become a big donor someday. And, you know, they probably will be more apt to donate to the cause if they've been feeling like they're even their smaller donation was valued and, and they are inspired to, to donate more. Those are my only two thoughts on, on that. Well, to piggyback off of what Tammy and AJ said, you know, I, I def, as, as far as defining a major donor, I, I, I believe it's just a, depends on the size of your, nonprofit organizations, you know, a, a, a major donor for a small nonprofit may be a very small one for a, a larger nonprofit. And, and as far as the fundraising, I, I, you know, it's, I feel it's very important to, to, to focus on relationships with your uh, target market as far as, you know, major donors, who they are, Make them feel they're they're really wanted, and make them feel like they're really part of the mission that that your nonprofit is is striving for. Um, and then it's it's like like AJ said, it's very important to be you know prepared and, and knowledgeable of of everything in your organization. You know when you're being prepared to ask for a, a, a major donation, um, it's. It's like anything else in life. If, you, if, if you're not prepared, you may not be very successful. So um, it was an interesting article. I enjoyed it. That's All my right. thoughts. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback, Tony. I think you've got our second article for us. Why don't you jump right in? Yes, yes, I do. So this is um, an article by Timothy Miller, uh, Nonprofits Who Go to Scale. So basically, um, he talks about uh, four nonprofits who um, don't necessarily, it, it, it's, it's more or less they're um, striving to make a difference in the world um, and uh, to change the world. And, and he talks about um, using technology and certain things to get your message out. And the first um, nonprofit he talks about is Water is Life. And basically that started out as using hashtag tags to um, shed light on the challenges of um, the third world countries who don't particularly have access to clean water, clean drinking water. And uh, they put out some shared videos um, to, to focus towards, uh, you know, countries who don't have that problem to make them more aware of the problem out there in the world, you know, you know, in some third world countries, uh, people have to walk miles to access to clean, to clean water, which is, you know, sad. Um, and you know, it, the, the videos that they created has had a great impact on people's lives. And the second uh, nonprofit is called a uh, safe light. 
And what that was is, uh, or is, it's a mobile app that connects uh, victims of domestic violence to safe houses in their, in their area. Um, I, I think it's, it's a, I've never heard of it. I think it's a great thing, you know, and um, basically what it is, you, you, you get the app and if you, something happens and you need a place to stay, it'll direct you in, in to a place to, to call home, you know, at least uh, temporarily. And the third is uh, the a human rights campaign. And that um, they leveraged uh, social media, specifically Facebook, to spread the word about their cause, uh, using celebrities, so on and so forth. And that, that seemed to be working for them. And last but not least is Greenpeace, which we've all heard of, I'm sure. Uh, and they use modern technology to educate the masses uh, as to the importance of taking care of planet Earth. And um, that, that seemed to have been working also. So um, what is everybody's thoughts? Boy, uh, where to start with this one? Um, <laughs> well, the opening kind of got me. I think those are all really good call outs for like using technology to advance your mission and, you know, awareness of your, of your organization, but I'm not so sure the author really grasped what a nonprofit, how a nonprofit operates. And the reason why I say that is, um, um, so I guess he's kind of conflating the fact that like, you need to leverage technology to advance, you know, and make a better world, but he really doesn't touch on the, on the, you know, I guess he's talking about nonprofits not having a profit. Uh, and so um, I guess nothing in return is what he's saying. All of the nonprofits that he's listing had to have something in return for what they were doing. Uh, I mean, you know, using Greenpeace as an example, they have boats and a TV show, you know, they can't, that can't be done just by social media posts, you know, that this is being funded by somebody and all with all the rest of these, I mean, you know, it's great to have social media awareness from celebrities and, you know, I guess like bringing idea or bringing it to fact that not everybody around the world has clean water in their life, but the real action that happens after those social media posts and awareness is really what matters. And to do that, you need funding. And funding happens through grants, donations and such, and then action with those donations to make it happen. So um, I like the article and I like him bringing kind of a focus on how technology can be leveraged to, you know, bring about social change. But I'm, I'm really th like, I think the it's a missed opportunity to show how that awareness can be then be turned into donations and action as opposed to just bringing up, you know, kind of the call to action itself. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, Tony, I think it's a good article, and I think it's always great to spotlight some nonprofits that are out there doing good in the world. But I'm going to kind of side with AJ on this one, that I had some real issues with this article, and, and specifically the writer and how he presented, you know, his thesis that technology helped to make these companies. Well, Greenpeace started in 1969, well before we've had any of the modern technologies, and they were way big before even, you know, computers were in every, every home. So, you know, they started, they started small, they grew, you know, and it's a matter of time. I think his thesis about technology is flawed because he really hasn't proven it. He's shown how these four nonprofits use technology, but this isn't what created and caused their successes. Now, the one I have the biggest issue with, and it's because I have personally been giving to this organization for a long, long time, is the human rights campaign. He mentions that they specialize in protecting human rights. Well, they specifically protect equality rights for LGBT people. And, and he says their action began in 2015. Well, please let everybody know in the organization when they began in 2004, that their, their time for 11 years meant absolutely nothing because they only started, and all the money I gave prior to that didn't mean anything because they only started actually doing something in 2015. So this author didn't do his homework He's factually inaccurate. He didn't prove his thesis. And frankly, I was so incensed by it. I went to look up his little thesis helper's website. He talks about these great things and, and how blah, 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 ethically these nonprofits are. 
And his thesis helpers is him writing term papers and dissertations for people and paying money for, they pay him and he writes their dissertation. And, you know, I, buyer beware, read this article first before you pay this dude to write anything on your behalf and question whether this is something you should ethically be doing to begin with. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. But thanks for the article, Tony. It gave me a chance to blow off a little steam this morning. I don't know where to go with that. But <laughs> I will say, I, I I, probably think that the article was probably written incorrectly or poorly as to, to Mark's point in some cases. But I think you know what I took away from this is we all know at the end of the day that technology and media and celebrity and who the celebrities are, whether it's you know the, the celebrities of our of the old golden years or whatever that may be for folks, if it was actors or actresses or singers or whatnot, and now they're influencers or bloggers, they're people on YouTube, all these various different component pieces, technology is out there. There, you know, companies can you know, or organizations can benefit from them. I think it's hard to, you know, say it's what makes them successful or not, but, you know, in a way to increase awareness and get the message out there and then to connect that with asking for donations or asking for support of where that may be. There's, it's a much bigger kind of, you know, thing than I think what this article kind of tries to lay out. I'm not sure where they're going with it, but I do think that it is something for the, for folks to think about, you know, in terms of is there a way to utilize technology or social media or videos or hashtags or all those things in in your in part of your toolbox for what you're utilizing. And I think to really answer that is you have to understand and know your donors and know your audience, know your target, know how all these things kind of play out for folks. Um, because I think to what Mark kind of highlighted, Mark is, you know, a um, an active participant in the, the human rights campaign. And so for him, obviously the writer did not think about his him as the donor, right? The audience on that, because what he ended up doing instead of doing, you know, thinking like, oh, I've called out this great organization, blah, blah, he insulted the donor, which is not what you probably want to do when you're thinking about um, uh, talking about your uh, uh, an organization or a cause, right? So you really have to know and understand your donors and understand that you probably need to know and understand the organization, get the, get the facts right, because someone's going to see it and they, they, whether or not they are a supporter of that particular organization or not, but especially if they are and they see that the, the actual data or facts are wrong, that's going to cause a, a reaction, which we saw today. So it, it was a great article for you to bring up, Tony, because I think that it, it did what we like to do on this podcast. It really encouraged discussion and also thought about what should other nonprofits think about when they're reading an article like this? Yeah, like what is the call to action from this article? What what are what is the author's point of view? What is he trying to kind of gauge at? And then how does that relate to a particular organization? And what can they learn from it? So good article. Um, I think that it's definitely something to to consider and talk about further. All right, I got our next article. Uh, yeah, I got our next article here. So uh, nonprofit, my article is from Nonprofit Hub, and it says, finish the summer strong with your nonprofit. So I'll go through and kind of give you what the article is, and then I'll add my little two cents at the end there. Penny flying everywhere. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so the article starts off as vacation requests, fewer conference invites, sporadic emails. Summer tends to be a lighter season for the nonprofit sector. Uh, and so they're telling you what to do with this extra time, um, that you have at the end of summer and they're sorry. So I'll go through what they list and then I'll let you know maybe what's wrong with this article idea. Anyway, start preparing a strategy. What is your campaign goals? Uh, which theme or messaging will you see? How many times will you make the ask this year? Uh, learn something this summer. Summer could be a useful time to learn and add new skills. Uh, what better way to prepare for a fundraising campaign than learn more about fundraising? Uh, engage your current supporters. So make sure you're engaging your donors during the summer. Support your team. With summer vacation still in full swing, nonprofit leaders might find themselves interacting with smaller workforce. Uh, but it's important to make an effort to support your team. Check in with your team members and encourage good communication while they're on the clock. I guess not off the clock. Anyway, take advantage of summer savings. Everyone knows loves a good sale. As business and retail stores start to advertise end of summer sales, these are discounts out there that you can benefit your nonprofit. So uh, let's start with right off the top, like um, most nonprofits have a 630 year end. And 
if you're having an end of summer, I mean, if unless you're on a calendar year end, but if you're having an end of summer lull, um, you're probably not doing what you need to be doing at the end of the fiscal year. So um, I can just speak from prior auditing experience, you know, probably 90% of my clients that I had when I was an auditor as a nonprofit auditor had year ends at 630. So July, August, you know, is probably very, so even into September is a very busy time for nonprofits that have a 630 year end. Um, and then, you know, for a nonprofit auditor, you're getting audited probably in August, September, October ish, um, which is now. So uh, for the for this article to say that you might have a lot of time in a nonprofit at the end of summer is kind of naive to say the least, I think. But I, I think it makes maybe some good call outs on what you can do at downtime, maybe in the first of the year, if you're a 630 year end, um, if your calendar year end, you know, it's possible that these, this is a lean time of, of work, but um, a lot of projects get done during the summer. So I would just caution anybody reading the article that, you know, possibly they're a little off base with their timing and this may be more suited for January thoughts, but I'd like to get a our opinion from the round table here. See what, see what you guys thought about the article. See if maybe, maybe I'm off base. Maybe there's more year end uh, nonprofits than I thought. Yeah. I, I, I actually worked at a year end nonprofit, but I like your point, AJ. And I think I'm going to kind of go with that for a minute because I thought the same thing. Like there are a lot of people who are closing at, at 630 and more than just, you know, getting away from this article for a minute, I kind of wanted to just talk about why that is, right? Because I think when you're setting up, if you're if you're somebody who's coming to this podcast because you're thinking about creating, a, you know, a new nonprofit, having a fiscal year end at 630 can make a lot of sense because you're not faced with the pressure of year end tasks uh, along with a, a potential audit that's going to happen after your 630 close. So for example, right, on calendar year end, W2s, 1099s, all those things that tend to pop around the corner in January, if you have a calendar year end and add that to the mix of all the other federal tax forms that are due in January, you're creating a boatload of work for yourself in, in January, right? So having a 630 so the premise of this article is you're going to have a lot of time in summer, but nonprofits who choose a 630 year end might actually be doing it the smarter way because they're giving themselves a little bit more of a smoothing process of having some work, i.e. preparing for an audit to do in late summer, and then some of the other work you know, that comes at year end naturally at the end of the year. But you know, certainly when I think some of these tools are very helpful, any time during the year that you find that your staff, you know, it could be after you've just finished a capital campaign and you've wrapped everything up. So, you know, preparing a new strategy, learning something for your new summer, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously budgets are always around the corner. So all these things can happen in your slower times and everybody will have different slower times. But um, yeah, I think the premise that everybody's going to just have this, you know, summer beach blanket bingo party to, you know, have fun at the end of summer with your nonprofit is, is, is a bit of a misnomer. I might add too, Mark, the reason normally the, the reason why 630 year end nonprofits have a 630 year end is because it usually follows a grant cycle. So a lot of government agencies and, and funders uh, operate on like a 630 fiscal year end or a 630 granting cycle. So that's normally why. Um, but again, like you said, it's, it's, up to the determination of, of the nonprofit. So in speaking about fiscal year ends, and if you're starting a new nonprofit, I would just take a look at what makes mo the most sense for your organization. Do you have a funky, you know, like funding cycle where things are coming in and, you know, reports are due in September or January, you know, then it may make, may make more sense to have a different year end than 630. And to be honest, if you have a different, I, I worked with some organizations that had like a March year end, uh, which was really strange, or even like an August year end, which makes it very strange to try and do a quarterly tax report reconciliation. But, you know, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. But um, I, it just made the most sense for the organization. So think about it. And it, none of this is set in stone. If you ever do need to make a fiscal year end change, you can do that. And it's a little bit of a pain, but it can be done. So I think for, non, for anybody listening on out there that's in a nonprofit or is thinking about starting one, it's probably a consideration that's not thought about very often is your fiscal year end or what your count, you know, what the, what the fiscal year looks like for, for your nonprofit. Yeah. What I was going to uh, say was 
both of you gentlemen had excellent points and I agree with both of you. But, but basically, I mean, in general, um, you know, creating, of course, creating a strategy is very important. Networking, you know, with your potential donors is very important. Keep your nonprofit on the radar. And your, your staff is the, the, the most important, you know, cog in the wheel. It's, you know, you need, you need to make them feel appreciated. But I don't know about sending them on, uh, sending them on uh, long vacations. <laughs> That's my thought. Yeah, to piggyback off all of those things, I think that um, to me, this is a year round event. So what Tony just said about, you know, all the important people in terms of connections, doing strategy, uh, encouraging vacations, all that kind of stuff. It's not all tied to the summer, right? It's probably should be something that is done throughout the year um, on a regular basis. And the other thing too, to think about it, I mean, summer typically tends to be the time where a lot of people take vacations, but if you want to, you can probably strategize a little earlier and have people take, you know, vacations throughout the year so that it's not, uh, you know, only one person in the office at the end of the day, you know, in the middle of the summer. Right. So, but some of these things take planning because you don't want to get into a position where you're like, you can't take vacation because everyone else is going to be gone. And so you're requiring somebody to keep the lights on and, and things running while everyone else is on vacation. So proper strategy and thinking of all those things up front is probably the best approach to do that. So, why I like the ideas of this article, I would just encourage it to be a year round type of view of looking at things because, you know, for a lot of organizations, especially smaller ones that are um, kind of growing and, and learning the, the ropes of things. No, there's not a point in time where it's a slow time of year. Every every point in time is a you know busy time of year. And whether it's because of the end of year requirements for filings or taxes or any of those types of things, or if it's a mid-year or whatever your fiscal year is, to really kind of think about that as a year-long kind of thought process or always keep that in the, in the back of your mind. And then the other thing I was going to add to when you're creating and developing is to really think about that year end, that fiscal, that fiscal year end um, that you guys that people want to use because while, while it's not uh it's not hard to change a fiscal year uh, into something else. It is kind of, it, it takes a lot of effort and work and a lot of communication and a lot of kind of stuff. So, and I um, had a, a gentleman in, in one of my companies in the past where, um, you know, he, I think every year I got an email, Hey, can we consider changing the fiscal year end to, in, you know, to be closer to our, our soup season? Cause we were a soup company. And it's like, no, <laughs> you know, because of X, Y, Z, you know, and, but it was like a conversation every year. And it's like, oh, well, you know what, if we would have thought about it as we started it, then maybe that could be something that you kind of consider um, to do because it's not usually as easy. And then there's also reporting requirements and things may get difficult to do a year to year comparison, all those fun things kind of can happen. But to really kind of think of that, I think a lot of those things come with a, a proper planning or pre-planning as you're developing things. Continuing our do's and don'ts series this week, uh, Tammy's got our, our do's and don'ts topic. Tammy, kick it off for us. Great. Thanks, AJ. So we've talked a lot about the importance of the board um, in our organization. And so we thought this week we would go to, with the do's and don'ts of board recruiting. So to start off with the do, the really big thing is to understand what the need is for the organization. You know, what should the well-rounded board look like? Know, you know, what you're looking for in terms of knowledge, expertise, um, the tie into the mission, you know, if they have experience to nonprofits, um, finance or business people to help with those types of things. So really understand where, where you need to go as a board and, and where you know, the, the skill sets that you need to be part of the board. And as long as they tie into that mission as well, that's obviously a, a, big, a big thing. So in terms of a don't, don't wait until the last minute to start searching. If you really think about it, boards have the staggered term uh, terms for a reason. You know, you may have a two to three years and as you know, people come in, um, certain people kind of resign off the board. You should really be thinking about what you need uh, throughout the process because actually bringing on a board member takes some time. And especially if you want to find that right person, that you take the, the time that it takes to do that. So who else has some ideas? Well, I'll jump in here. Uh, well, like you just said, um, you want you want the person that's coming on board to accept your mission and really want to help, not just to grab anybody. Um, you know, um, a, a lot of these bigger nonprofits, you know, they have boards that people are real professionally skilled people. But then again, on the flip side, I've seen, you know, some smaller nonprofits, uh, they may, 
go after people who have been in a particular field who are skilled, but maybe might be retired. Um, so they wanted to go with someone like that. I, I guess it just depends on um, the goal, the mission, and and of course the I, I feel the size of your uh, nonprofit. Yeah, I would say I totally agree with what both of you have said. I I kind of approach these things from a little bit more of a you know a pen and paper like get let's get down what skills and qualifications are, and I think creating a skills matrix or a, you know, a, maybe even a program matrix, like, you know, we, we serve these specific areas. Do we have somebody on the board that reflects those specific areas? Do we have somebody in the finance world? Do we have somebody, you know, who knows this specific program? If it's medical related, do we have, you know, the right medical personnel who are dealing with this kind of stuff? If it's school related, you know, are we representing teachers? And, you know, if it's religious, are there clergy members and parishioners? And so it could be, you know, setting up your own individual matrix to see what that works. And don't necessarily pass people over just because they don't have board experience. Some, you got to start somewhere, right? But if people are have the time and the talent, and I really like Tony's idea of, of retirees as well, right? They, they often find themselves with a lot of time on their hands and a real desire to give back. And so just because they may never have served on a board before, does, don't rule them out. They could be a great addition to your board. Yeah. I think the other one is consider the need for diversity on your board and not just, you know, diversity uh, meaning race, but also like diversity of experience and diversity of like jobs and diversity of viewpoints. You know, I think it's really to have a well-rounded board, you need all of that stuff kind of mixed in there together and, and make sure that it's, you know, um, that you're getting points of view that are maybe, you know, even contrary to what you would normally think you would, what you would normally get. But I think having a big diverse board or at least a board full of diverse members really makes a huge difference when, you know, coming to conclusions, you know, there's often times that I've sat in a board meeting and I'm kind of the financial person in that board, but there's some really good questions that are answered from a programmatic person about financials or about, you know, kind of the, the flow of, of how the board meeting's going. So, um, I think it's really good to diversify, you know, points of view. And of course, you know, leaderships, uh, positions like a board really need to be diverse to be able to bring home, you know, the, the mission and, and get different points of view from things. You know, you can't have, a, you know, a bubble full of yes men and women that just go along with whatever the leader of that board says. So I think it's really good to have a diverse set of group of people in experience too in, on that board position. And I mean, the don't would be just grab somebody with a pulse. You know, you don't want to just, you know, take the first comers that want to be on the board. You know, you want to be in a constant, we talked about, you want to be on a constant search for board members. Good board members are hard to find. So you constantly want to be, you know, on the lookout for good board members. So I would say, really keep your eye out constantly and make sure, you know, there's been situations where people have to remove themselves from a board because of an emergency. This is a volunteer position and does take up some time. So often people get in and they need to get out sometimes. So if you have a list or people in the wings waiting to be on the board, you're far more better that set up to handle that far more better. Gosh, that's not good English, but <laughs> you're far better off than, you know, waiting until one of those people move fall off or have to leave to start looking for board members again, because this is a time and sensitive kind of uh, proposition. You have to interview, you have to find the people that want to be there. You have to, you know, hopefully have somebody that's diverse in their thoughts and who they are. And then, you know, you got to go through this, you know, essentially a hiring process to vet them. So it's, it's a very difficult river to navigate and you want to be constantly looking at out for new great board members to bring on to to your board. Yeah, I think that's an interesting part kind of combinating uh both of what you and Tony had said about it is, you know, you don't want to just grab anybody and, and then get a large enough kind of size is not as important anymore especially if you have a bunch of people on there with maybe not the right experience, not the right um uh tie into the mission, not the right, whatever it could be. Right. And, but they may, you don't need to have a hundred people on a board to serve it. Cause it actually might 
cause some clunkiness and be difficult in other ways. So you do want to make sure I like the idea of what Mark said about really having that matrix and kind of saying, what do we need? What kind of skill set? And so you're really defining and bringing on a board and getting it to the right size. So that does match the organization. Um, Cause I do think that there are times where you're just like, we'll grab anybody to, you know, like, well, anyone who has a pulse or anyone who's interested, we want people on our board. And it's like, well, then now you have a hundred people and you can't get things done and you're not running as effect, uh, efficiently. So I do think that um, as part of the process, one should do is ask a potential candidate, you know, to if they're willing to volunteer or serve on the committee before, you know, making a final decision or have them participate in a couple of meetings before you, you know, get them on to see if they are the right fit or to see if they want to be part of the organization. Because I think sometimes on the flip side, someone's asked to be part of a board and so they'll go ahead and, and join and then they're like, oh, I don't really have the time to dedicate to it, or I really don't have the interest, or I don't have whatever fill in the blanks there. And so, but now they feel like they're stuck on a, on a board and they don't know what to do. So really, you know, seeing if they really drive with the rest of the team and working with that is a, is a good idea. And um, the other thing is don't forget to research conflict of interest in case there are things that um, happen. You may have a board member on the board who um, is somehow tied to the organization by providing services or, or by doing something else. Or, um, and so you might want to just think about that. It's not a deal breaker, but you need to be able to disclose that and kind of work through that as a board. So think about that. Well, that's a really good one, Tammy. I never thought, you know, one of the things that we always suggest uh, is that a board has a conflict of interest policy. You know, we really need to have a, a conflict of interest policy that's written and approved by the board and that everybody signs so that it's clear what a conflict of interest is and how you navigate around that. Whether it means, you know, like if, if they're hiring your, say you're a lawyer and they're hiring your law firm to do uh, um, a law, a law, you know, a, a lawyer ease kind of thing, you know, you want to know what the, did they need to abstain from the vote of using that law firm or whatever it may be, or does it, you know, does your conflict of interest preclude them from having it? So, yeah, I think really good call out on the, on that one. And then the last one is just be knowledgeable of your charter and your bylaws on like what the minimum amount of board members are. You don't want to fall. You don't want to get into a situation where you either have too many that it's, it's, you know, prescribed in your charter that you can't have above so many, or you definitely won't, don't want to fall below the required amounts needed for, for those board members. So, but yeah, really good discussion point, everybody. And, uh, good roundtable this time. Mark, you're going to take us out. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Profitless on Purpose. We really appreciate you joining us and being with us and spending some time learning about nonprofits from an accountant's perspective. Um, please join us on Twitter at Profitless Pod is our handle. And you can also, you know, watch us on YouTube, um, make comments. We always appreciate comments in some future episodes. We're looking forward to answering some of the questions you all have sent in. So, you know, look for that and we'll see you next time at the pod. Thanks everybody. Bye. <laughs>